good to be in God's house this morning again as we come together, as we congregate like this. And uh, this morning, actually, I want to start off from a portion which Brother read during the communion. So, <clears throat> shall we uh, look at Psalm 40? which is the Old Testament version of what he read. And we will go back, go to the Hebrews portion also later. So this is a psalm, and Psalm 40, as many of us know, is a messianic psalm because it talks about Jesus Christ, and it talks about his role, and it prophesies about him, right? And um, let's look at verse 6, 7, and 8, and... This morning, we are going to talk about the burnt offering. Amen? We will talk about the burnt offering. So, verse 6, it says, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened, and the New Testament, but you have prepared a body for me. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. It is written in the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, for your law is within my heart. Verse 6, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened, or my ears you have pierced. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. So what is this burnt offering? Right? Let's look at where this starts. Now, where does the burnt offering start, actually? So, a lot of us think that the burnt offering started, you know. In the days of Moses, the Levites were to bring the burnt offering, etc. And people were to bring the burnt offering into God's house, into the temple, into the tabernacle. But that's not where it started. So, let's go to Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 20. And so we see here the first use of this term, burnt sacrifice. So we know this part of the Bible where, you know, Noah has been in the flood and he and his family have been miraculously saved. And when they come out, um, the Lord tells him to do certain things. And in verse 20, he says that Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. And we'll find that these two things, you know, they go together, the burnt offering and the smoothing or the pleasant aroma that God finds. And actually, if you look at this, there is no explanation of burnt offering before. Noah just knew. Noah knew. And so like a lot of things, like, like quite a few things actually, we understand that this came down from Adam, Adam and Eve. They learnt these definitions in the Garden of Eden. So let me ask you another question, right? Uh, how many animals did Noah take on the ark? Sorry, loudly, anybody has the answer? How did he take them rather? What was the arrangement? Two of each, correct? Anybody has any other answer? You only get half marks for this. See, you ate 8 o'clock church Members, no, I'll tell you something I'll not tell in the 10 o'clock service. I consider it you to be more serious Christians. So serious Christians should know better. Right? It is actually seven of the clean, and of those who are not clean too, and of the birds also, seven. Right? So, how did, there again, if you look, and why, why, why am I bringing that up is, because there also God does not explain clean and unclean. But Noah knows. How does he know? These definitions come from the Garden of Eden. Right from Adam and Eve. Which is why God was angry with Cain. 
for his sacrifice because he expected Cain to know that blood should be shed and Cain knew it but he brought a sasta offering right so let's go ahead so what is the purpose of this burnt offering the purpose of the burnt offering is of course consecration let's look at genesis 22 verse 2 it is a it is a story of abraham and uh, genesis 22 verse 2 he says take your son your only son isaac whom you love and go to the land of moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering right now see what abraham says in verse 5 he says stay here with the donkey the lad and i will go yonder which is that side beyond and we will worship and come so burnt offering a is connected with worship that is why you know the sweet savor the aroma that is pleasing to god because it is offered up to god it is completely offered up to god so the burnt offering is connected with worship and it is also connected with consecration where if you read in ephesians 5 2 he says he gave himself up you know it is it is a consecration when i give myself up to when i give myself when i set myself apart and i give myself con con completely to him so burnt offering is connected with worship and with consecration and it is a model of jesus christ before the law because if you look in this chapter 22 verse 13 we know the story god says do not lay your hand upon the lad and then th we see that there is a ram which is there and in in verse 13 it says at the second part of that verse 22 13 genesis 22 13 so abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son a type of jesus christ who is offered up instead of you and me as a burnt offering completely irrevocably completely offered right so we are going to look at what it is under the law how it was and this is before the law now uh, and you know even job job who lived before the times of the law if you read chapter 1 verse 5 he offered burnt offerings on behalf of each of his children right so uh, he um, the burnt offerings we see there offered before the law and we see even moses's father in law jethro he also offered burnt offerings before the law but during the time of the law we see certain instructions that god gives us and so let's turn to our um, portion leviticus chapter 1 and we can probably spend some time over here in leviticus chapter 1 now we see first in leviticus chapter 1 verse 2 it says that when any of you bring an offering to the lord and then in verse 2 it says the offering is a burnt sacrifice of the herd let him offer a male without blemish and he shall offer it of his own free will at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the lord so the individual the individual offers worship or offers burnt offering voluntarily there is no compulsion he offers voluntarily and yes there are requirements that we will see but first when you and i bring a burnt offering to god we bring it voluntarily right and if you look at how uh, the burnt offering is modeled like for example when we look at job chapter 1 verse 5 we see that he offered it on behalf of his family also so that is why you see here he which is the male the head of the family brings the offering and he brings it not only for himself he brings it on behalf of his family too as an atonement that is verse 4 it is offered as a, as an atonement and now he has to do certain things he brings it at the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the lord now do you know who said this i am the door yeah so what is all of this testifying to the B bible says in the new testament all of these were just a shadow the substance of which was to come and we know that christ is the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets everything testifying to him so if when you read these scriptures don't get lost 
you will find Jesus everywhere, right? And so we bring the burnt offering only through Jesus. And so he shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering. And in uh, some versions, it probably reads, he shall press his hand on the head of the burnt offering. So he identifies, right? So he is not going to get burnt. The man is not going to get burnt. But he identifies by pressing on the sacrifice, on the sacrificial animal. And then the animal is taken forward inside and sacrificed on behalf of him, which is the substitution, the law of substitution. Christ who died in our place. We should have been there, but he took that place, right? And now, um, as, as an offering for sin. But he, he shall kill the bull, now verse 5, he shall kill the bull before the Lord, and the priests Aaron's sons shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around on the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into pieces. Right? And um, we, read, we read further what they do. Basically, if you look at everything, you look at verse 8 and 9, all the parts, the burnt offering, unlike the other offerings, there is nothing that is left or that is given or that can be consumed either by the priest or by the offerer. In some offerings, some portion is for the priest. And in some offerings, the person who's offering can quickly eat it inside in the court of the temple, uh, you know, with, the, with his family. But in the burnt offering, nothing can be consumed. Everything is given to God. Only the skin, only the skin, Leviticus 7 verse 8 says, only the skin goes to the priest. Everything else, the fat, the meat, the head, the entrails, which is the inside organs, all of that goes to God. So it is completely given, completely irrevocably given. So God's portion is everything. The priest's portion is only the skin. The offerer's portion is nothing. He gives completely everything. Right? And uh, so what do we actually learn from this? I mean, how, how does this work in the New Testament? So when you look at the animals that a person can bring, you know, a rich person can bring a bull. And somebody who is not so rich can bring the sheep or the goats which is in verse 10. And a poor person can bring, in verse 14, he shall bring an offering of turtle doves or young pigeons. So basically, you can, you can bring a bull or a sheep or a goat or a turtle dove for sacrifice. And we also see that, uh, you see the burnt offering while the individual is allowed to offer it voluntarily, we read the individual can bring an offering of his own free will, but corporately, that is together as a group, as a nation, as a believing nation, for them it is compulsory. Shall we look at this? Uh, we can look at Leviticus chapter 6. Leviticus chapter 6 and verse, uh, you know, 12 and 13, it says, A fire on the altar shall be kept burning, it shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order on it, and he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. A fire shall be burning on the altar, it shall never go out. It shall never go out. And you know, there are, there are on this altar, uh, the lambs of the first year are offered and it is continually offered. It is continually offered. So there is a continual fire before God and the sheep or the lamb, we know what does John declare? He declares, behold the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So we see Jesus Christ modeling that sacrifice and the... Um, uh, and in some cases, the burnt offering was compulsory. For example, every childbearing woman, when she returns from childbearing, she makes a burnt offering. She makes sometimes a burnt offering is offered along with some other offering also, like a sin offering or a 
meal offering or a free will offering, etc. And we're not going to look at what each of those are. A, a leper, a, a somebody who is who became unclean, and they, they or a Nazarite who took a vow to keep long hair and to be separate unto God to serve God, and suppose he came in contact with a dead body, then he has to offer a burnt offering, and then they are clean. So in this way, we find that the burnt offering is compulsory as a nation, as a group, but individually voluntary. Now, what do we learn from this? As a body of Christ, when we come together, we are identified as Christ's. And the worship that we come must be, give must be pure. Bible says, worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness, right? But individually, there is no compulsion. There is blessing, there is benefit, but God is not like Satan who captures your free will. He mentions a requirement when you come together, but individually, he does not arm twist your free will. The beauty is when you give it of your own accord. Amen? Now, this offering is given on what kind of altar? What is the altar made of? It is made of bronze. How many altars are there in the tabernacle? Two altars are there. One is just as you enter, which is this altar, the bronze altar. The bronze altar is also called the altar of sacrifice. And there is another altar which is inside. When you go into the holy place, just before the most holy place, where no man can enter, only the priest enters once a year. But inside the holy place, there is one more altar called the golden altar. Now don't mix the two. The bronze altar is for sacrifice. On the golden altar, God prohibits, he says very explicitly, you will not offer burnt offerings over there. Over there only incense is offered. Here sacrifices are offered. There incense is offered. And in the New Testament, in the Revelation, what do we read? The incense is the prayers of the saints. So both the altars testify to Christ's work. The bronze altar when we bring the sin offering testifies to his finished work. But it also testifies to his continual work. The work of justification. Because there is a continual fire. And you and I, we are continually justified because of the blood that is shed. So, although we sin, our sins are forgiven, the penalty is taken away. And we still stand righteous before God. Amen? So, whenever we sin, we do not condemn ourselves. But we confess our sins. And we receive his cleansing, his forgiveness. Correct? So, the bronze altar shows his continual work of justification. And the golden altar testifies to Jesus' continual work of being our intercessor. He is the chief high priest. Our prayers go up to him. And he is continually interceding before the throne of God. Amen. So these are two different things. And we also see that bronze actually is made of copper and tin. And it sustains fire. So A, it speaks of judgment. And secondly, when you know the plague of snakes hit the children of Israel, what, did, what was God's prescription? The snake. And what was the snake made of? It was made of bronze. And so bronze again there. And who identifies with that? Jesus picks that up and he says, the son of man will be lifted up like the bronze serpent was lifted up. So, he is going to be on the cross and the bronze serpent is a model or a, or a, or a, or a witness of him. And so, the bronze also signifies his divine nature which is certified as righteous, judged as righteous. Amen? That is why it took the judgment and still it, uh, he resurrected. So, here is what we are saying. The, the burnt offering offered on the bronze altar 
symbolizing the righteousness of symbolizing the worship unto god the complete worship given unto god and we jesus is the lamb he is the offering and we identify by laying our hands on the uh, i mean the in the old testament they identify by laying on the hands and today we identify by confessing by believing and by confessing so our sin transferred to jesus christ and he is he being punished and he is made a, an uh, as a, as an offering and for on behalf of us now there is something else that we can see over here if you look at leviticus chapter 6 verse 10 you will find that the priest shall put on linen garments and his linen trousers he shall put on his body this is when they are handling the ashes of the burnt offering right and today we are kings and priests unto god and our garments should be linen meaning what what does that mean okay let's look at an interesting portion ezekiel 44 verse 17 and 18 somewhere in the middle of the bible in the book of ezekiel god says something very interesting now he's talking about the priests the levites and the sons of zadok who was a uh, <coughs> who served during the time of david and he says like this uh, and it shall be whenever they enter the gates of the inner court that they shall put on linen garments no wool shall come upon them when they minister within the gates of the inner court or within the house they shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen trousers on their body they shall not clothe clothe themselves with sweat or they shall not clothe themselves with anything that causes sweat so why is he saying this what is god's enmity with sweat go back to the garden of eden what did he what was his curse by the sweat of your brow you will toil you will labor right and god doesn't want that over here and our offering the offerings of the priests the offerings should not be of our own effort it should be his own effort and i'll just take this moment to tell you in in the book of deuteronomy the you know god institutes that altars can be built within the territory of each tribe and he says this these altars for the for the people to come and make burnt offering right you cannot every time go to jerusalem suppose in this territory um 5000 women were pregnant this year and they gave birth and they are coming back they may not always go back to jerusalem or or, or go back to shilo or where where it was in the old testament so they go to the place within the tribe and offer the burnt offerings and the stones of those burnt offerings are to be picked up they are stones on which the bible says no hammer should have hit meaning no human effort it speaks of grace it speaks of righteousness that is by received by grace not by your works and mine right and we see this interpreted very clearly for us in revelations 19 verse 7 and 8 can we turn to revelations 19 7 and 8 and 19 verse 7 and 8 says now he's talking of the bride right let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife who's his wife the church who are the church we are the church and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen clean and bright or clean and white for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints so where what is our righteousness our righteousness is from the lord because our own righteousness is filthy rags before him but his righteousness so you see all of this model before in the old testament and so now we come to what exactly do we get or we gain or we learn from this and in doing that we first go to the portion that we read during communion let's look at hebrews chapter 10 verse 8 to 10 okay so you it starts in verse 5 and it talks about that portion and says sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body you have prepared for me 
right? And that's the first hint. He says, more than the sacrifice and the offerings, he asks for the whole body. And actually this year it, is, it talks about Jesus Christ, but we will learn what we have to learn from this. Burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure, but I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. That means instead of the burnt offerings and sacrifice, he requires the submission of our will to obey him. Amen? And then he says, look at this. Verse 9. He said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first that he may establish the second. So for us, it is the second. That means the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the body that he prepared, that we accept. And then we give our own selves in return. That is to do his will, right? And we saw that the fire on the altar is continual. And we look at this being modeled again in Romans chapter 12 verse 1. What is this famous verse? It says, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God which is your reasonable sacrifice. Amen? So Jesus Christ first our burnt offering and as we identify with him as a worship to Jesus as a worship to our God we give ourselves, our bodies as a living sacrifice, a continual offering before God. Amen? We continually offer ourselves before God. And in um, Ephesians 5 verse 2, let's read this. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2. And walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice for a sweet-smelling aroma. You remember this phrase? We read it in Genesis. We read it in Leviticus. And, uh, you know, in 1 Samuel 15, we see where, you know, Saul rebelled against uh, God. And he was commanded to do something. He was commanded to slay all, uh, including the flock. But he kept something back. And there Samuel comes and he says, uh, is not obedience better than sacrifice? Right? And he says, I, what I understand from that is, when we offer obedience to God, we offer the most costly worship. Because like we saw here in Hebrews 10, we offer our will. And so what Samuel is saying in one sense is, that is not obedience the most, because he gives an excuse. He says, I kept this aside for a burnt offering, right? And so what Samuel says is, is not obedience the most superior burnt offering that you could have given, but you chose something cheaper. And so it is with us when we choose not to obey, when we choose to do our own will, when we choose against our conscience, when we choose not to believe, and we give other reasons. We choose a cheaper burnt offering where we can give something better. right? And that is something that we should remember. And even David says this, you know, when he commits the sin of counting, counting the men, the fighting men, and God pronounces there is a plague, there is a curse. And he goes to Arona and he says, I want to purchase this place. And Arona says, you take it freely. You are the king, take it freely. But he says, I want to offer burnt offerings over here. And he says, I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord which do not cost me anything. Right? And so today, you and me, when we look at our own personal worship, when we look at our own personal worship, what are we giving that costs us? And what is it that is the most costly for us that I can give? Is it my sleep? Is it my time? Is it my money? Is it my effort? And for most of us, it is obviously time. And are we giving the best and the costliest to God? And God expects it. That's why he says that the sacrifice should be pure. It should be without blemish. 
and because he expects the best right and he and um in 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 hosea 6 verse 6 he says that i desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of god more than burnt offerings right but how do you how do you get the knowledge of god and i believe it is when you bring worship when you bring burnt offering before the god before the lord when you bring that which is the most costliest to you like the woman with the jar of alabaster and she brought it to the lord's feet and she broke it and it was more than a year's worth earnings and she brought that and she gave it to him saying i consider this worthless compared to you and when we do that with the most costly thing the most the thing that 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 is the most uh, we lay the most value and the price for and sometimes you know it is even the concern of our family and if we can bring that before the lord and say lord this concern is lesser than you because i compromise what i am to give you because of my concern for my family and that becomes an idol but if i were to give it to god it becomes my burnt offering my worship unto god and sometimes it is the concern of our wealth and it is the concern of growing my means and acquiring more means because it is a concern of my occupation my work my job my business and i do this at the expense of giving god's best giving god the best and sometimes giving god also means giving or giving of my availability to god's people right and i am not giving myself to god or to his people because of my concern for my occupation or my job or my business and that becomes an idol but if i were to say lord i will give this less value and i will give this the time my availability to you and to your people as worship then that becomes my burnt offering my costly offering to god and he respects it he respects it and it becomes to him a sweet smelling aroma otherwise what can you give to god what can you give to god that makes him happy that gives him pleasure right but this when we give it becomes important and 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 uh, beautiful in his eyes and when we do we receive a revelation of who he is and and i i often tremble when i read that portion in the book of judges judges chapter 13 you know when we read about samson or and his birth and he, and and you know actually the angel of the lord over there is the lord jesus christ himself right and he says what will you offer to me but if you offer offer a burnt offering unto god and when they do what happens he reveals himself he goes up in a flame and how do you do what hosea says hosea says the knowledge of god i desire more than sacrifice more than more than burnt offering how will you do that when you bring your offering the expensive thing in the first place you will receive a sight a revelation of who your god is and that becomes to the lord your knowledge that then you offer in your knowledge having understood him you worship and you extol him in your praises and that becomes costly to him and hosea says the the bull calves of my lips what is the bull calves of my lips it is the fruit of my lips which is my praise and my worship and then our worship becomes expensive otherwise if i have no knowledge of him when when people are singing i will stand like this because i don't know who he is because i have not met him at the altar of offering amen and so we bring the most expensive thing and let me quickly show you two more things let's go to first samuel 7 verse 12 okay in this story what happens here is that um you know the ark was captured by the philistines and then it came back and uh, it is it is resting in a particular place and uh, you know samuel he he says at that point he comes to the people and the ark was in that place for about 20 years and samuel speaks to the people and he says you cleanse yourselves cleanse yourself from your idols 
And he says in 1 Samuel 7 verse 3, put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths, right, uh, from among you. And um, the people in verse 4, it says the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths. And Baal and Ashtoreth are husband and wife, actually. And so the people worship the God and this goddess. And they, they are gods and goddesses of rain and fertility. And, you know, therefore that is how they induce people into sexual immorality. And so they cleanse themselves. And while they are cleansing, you know, they gather at this place called Mitzpah. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the children of Israel, when they are gathered over there, there the Philistines gather to attack them. And very strangely, in this particular place, usually you will find the king or the priest or the prophet exhorting people to pray and cry out to God. Here, in verse 8, the children of Israel cried to the people, Samuel, and says, do not cease to cry to God. The people are encouraging the prophet, please continue to pray. It happened reverse here. And so he prays to God, right, in, in, verse, in verse 9. Now look what happens here in verse 9. And Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel. And the Lord answered him. Now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to, the battle, to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day and so confused them. That they were overcome before Israel. Actually that word they're confused also means he crushed them. And so they were smitten and they were overcome. Right? And then the, the, the Israelites drew them away. And then in verse 12 see what happens. Samuel took a stone and set it between Mitzpah and Shen. And called its name Ebenezer. That means the stone that witnesses that the Lord has helped me. So, what does he say? Actually, because the, thus far the Lord has helped us means he's actually declaring God. God has revealed to him, him to them as Yahweh Ezer, which means I am Yahweh who helps you. How Jehovah Jireh is the God who provides, right? Or Jehovah Shalom is the God, my peace. So, he's saying, Yehovah, my help. And when we bring a costly burnt offering to God, He hears our prayers. He hears and He brings deliverance against our enemies. And He brings answer and He becomes our help. And I don't know who wrote Psalm 121. Uh, maybe David, but it is unsigned. But whoever did that then, He remembers this. That's why He says that you are my help. Right? I lift my eyes unto the mountains. Where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord. He's saying, Yahweh is there over there. Same thing. So when we bring that which is costly, that which we price the most, and we put it before God, and we say, this is not important, but you are. Therefore, I lay it at your feet. I give you my best. And he answers us in the midst of our enemies. Right. And now I will end with this one very dark illustration. I am not sure that I particularly understand everything about this portion. But I want you to look at this and ponder this. To understand the meaning and the power of a burnt sacrifice. Let's turn to first King, sorry, 2 Kings chapter 3 verse 7, verse 27. It is not a very good example. It is not very pleasant to read. It is a very dark example. But you can see what is the power of burnt sacrifice. Now, in this story, what happens is, you know, um, Israel, Judah, and Edom, they go to attack Moab, right? The Moabites are the enemies of Israel. And there, they actually find that on the way, there is no water for seven days. There is no water for the army. There is no water for the animals. And so the king of Israel, who is not a good believer, he, uh, he says, uh, he's actually the son of Ahab. So he's the son of Ahab and Jezebel. And he says that, you know, we have been brought here to, all three kings have been brought here to die before Moab. And so then, of course, Jehoshaphat asks, is there a prophet over here? And then Elisha prophesies. And Elisha prophesies. Now look who's, Eli who's prophesying. 
Elisha is prophesying. This is the same man who could see in the spirit and say, you are surrounded by chariots of fire, so don't worry. He's the same person who raised people from the dead, who before Jesus fed thousands. This man is prophesying what he prophesies. He says in verse 18, this is, a, and this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites into your hand. What is this? This is the word of the Lord. Elisha is prophesying. And he says, And you shall attack every fortified city and every good city, choice city, and shall cut down every good tree and stop up every spring of water and ruin every good piece of land with stones. So in a hopeless situation, they went to the prophet and the prophet says, God will give you victory. Now look what happens. Now, the war happened. In the war, what happened? Israel is winning. Israel, Judah and Edom, the three kings, they are winning. And the king of Moab senses he is in trouble. Now see what happens. Now in the 20, verse 24. So when they came to the camp of Israel, Israel rose up and attacked the Moabites so that they fled before them. And they entered their land killing the Moabites. Then they destroyed the cities and each man threw a stone on every good piece of land and filled it. And etc. etc. They did it. Right? And the now in, in how were the slingers surrounded and attacked it? Now verse 26. Look at this. When the king of Moab saw that the battle was too fierce for him, he took 700 men who drew swords, his best fighting men. And he tried to break through to the king of Edom. King of Edom is in alliance with Israel and Judah coming to attack. He probably saw that this, person, this king is nearest. Let me try and attack and kill him and make way to escape. But they could not. Now verse 27. Then he took his eldest son who would have reigned in his place and offered him as a burnt offering upon the wall. And then what happened? There was indignation. There was anger. There was wrath against Israel. So they departed from him and returned to the land. So Israel who is winning, who is conquering, they put their hands up and they walk back. And I want to tell you that you and I sit here very comfortably because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. Not offering anything expensive. But the people of the world, they are very smart. They know this principle works. They know offering works. They start 6 o'clock in the morning. And that's why they prosper and succeed where you are left behind. You go to a simple construction work site. If somebody, some construction, some builder comes to do construction in your building and they put, before they put the scaffolding, you know what happens. There'll be little rice. There'll be their red cross. They make an offering to their God. They appease the deity whom they believe in for protection and safety. But you and I carelessly go out of home without even praying. We eat food without praying. And in our daily walk, we bring nothing of expense to the Lord. If it is inconvenient, for us, God is convenience, not the Lord God. But let us learn this day. Let us bring a costly burnt offering to God. And let us see his victory in our lives. See this unbelieving king. He knew. And I, I still don't understand everything about what happened here. But what I can understand is that God understands. Because he has placed that principle of the burnt offering. And he understands the expense of sacrifice. And even though he doesn't like child sacrifice, he has to respect the sacrifice. Amen? You and I have a much better offering and a much better God to offer to. 
and we have better rewards. So let us offer that which is expensive to the Lord God. Amen. Shall we bow our heads? Thank you, Lord, that you are God eternal. And you made beforehand for the foundation of the world, you gave us the most perfect sacrifice, Lord. And having given the sacrifice, Lord, we now come to you and we pray, we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, as a reasonable worship, Lord, to you. But we don't want to stop there, Lord. We want to go beyond the reasonable worship and we want to give better and better and that which is more expensive, we want to give. That which costs us more, we want to give. We want to give the best of our time, the best of our health, the best of our strength. That which we esteem most, that which is closest to our heart, we want to lay it down at your feet. To worship you. For only one reason. To bring a sweet smelling aroma, a savor before you. To bring you delight and joy. That we may have a revelation of who you are. And know you and the power of your resurrection and experience you and the might of the Lord Jesus Christ in our life. We commit ourselves, our families and one another into your hand as we hear this word. May it percolate and penetrate deep into our hearts and bear much fruit, Lord. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.